So welcome to this second session of the ELD MOOC 2015. Welcome to this afternoon uh, with the title Live Together and Decide Together. I am Claudia Musekamp and I am the online tutor for this MOOC along with Ali Salah who is based in the US. So glad to see you all, glad to see you this week uh, in this live event. Um, we had scheduled a presentation by Professor Mark Reed from Birmingham City University. He couldn't make it uh, today, but he sent a very nice video that is already available on the platform. You see it on the, in the news section on the front page, um, that on, on stakeholder engagement. Uh, so I was delighted, very delighted to that, uh, about that video, but I'm also equally delighted to welcome Nicola Favretto today. He is our speaker today. Nicola Favretto is an env environmental economist. He has extensive experience in livelihood impact assessment and policy analysis and he has done intensive research in environmental sustainability across Africa and Latin America. He is currently part of the scientific coordination team of the ELD initiative and he joins us today from the United Nations University, uh, the Institute for Water, Environment and Health. So welcome with me, Nicola Favretto. Thank you very much, Claudia, and good morning or afternoon to all the MOOC participants. Uh, uh, indeed, I am extremely excited and uh, honored to follow up to Mark Reid's presentation on the topic of today's presentation, Live Together, Decide Together. Well, I will provide some concrete examples of the use of a tool called multi-criteria decision analysis to engage with stakeholders in drill and research. Uh, just in the first slide, I, I picked up to, I think, quite representative picture. On your left hand, you see a farmer with his cattle, actually in a quite dry area in southern Botswana. And on the right hand, it's a photo from the workshop, uh, policy workshop that we had in the end of the project. Um, first of all, I wish, as Claudia mentioned, I will strongly encourage you to check out the video of Professor Mark Reed on the, on the link that you can see on this slide. Is uh, entitled Engaging with Stakeholders, and not surprisingly, uh, Professor Reed is quite engaging in his video, which is in a documentary style. Uh, it's uh, highly interesting, and it outlines some of uh, the examples from his experiences on how uh, it, we can engage with stakeholders. Today, I will provide a more specific example from a case study that has been supported by the Economics of Land Degradation Initiative in southern Botswana, in Kalahari. Um, just to give you a, an overall picture of the study area, um, rangeland systems in Botswana's Kalahari are a key source of income and provide the local community with a range of ecosystem service benefits. Uh, if you look at the first photo on the top left, you see cattle, so we're talking about meat production. You see a wild watermelon, so we are talking about uh, wild food, uh, wild uh, traditional medicines. We're talking about building material. If you look again in the first photo, you see these fences are built just using material that is collected in the surrounding area. So these people do rely on access to a wide range of ecosystem services and, and their benefits in order to make their living. Uh, but these populations uh, face the, I would say the most common problems faced by dryland population. As a result of climate change, 
intense droughts and unsustainable land use practices, they are experiencing an, an, an increasing level of land degradation in the form of retreat of grass cover. So they are losing uh, perennial grasses that are normally really important for grazing cattle, a key source of nutrition for their animals. Um, they are experiencing increasing levels of bush encroachment. So areas getting covered by quite thick thorny bushes that do not make possible anymore to use these areas either for grazing or for setting up other uh, income generating uh, activities. And also it gets more and more difficult to collect or get access to the other range of, uh, of uh, ecosystem services for like wild food as I mentioned before. And uh, in some parts of the country, they are also experiencing the reactivation of sand dunes that were previously stable. So as you can imagine, uh, the impact of these uh, patterns is having a tremendous effect on the way that local population sustain its own living. So the key question that we try to address today is how to work together to find solution to the challenges posed by land degradation. And uh, in uh, Mark Reed's video, one, uh, one key uh, concept that is stressed clearly is that we must focus on local knowledge and rely on local knowledge in order to uh, facilitate choices that meet local needs and priorities. And today I want to present you the use of multi-criteria decision analysis, which is a tool that we use in our research in Botswana to rank alternative land use options. So if you look at the diagram on, the, on your right hand, you will see four lines. And each of these lines is one land use option. We are looking into communal livestock grazing, so unfenced uh, open areas private cattle ranches, so fenced areas, private game ranches, and wildlife management areas, which are areas protected by the government to conserve biodiversity. So through multi-criteria analysis, we looked into these four different land uses, and we quantified and scored and weighted a range of qualitative and quantitative criteria to assess how each of these uh, land use option uh, performs in terms of uh, ecosystem service delivery. Now, uh, I don't want to scare you with this uh, matrix. There is no need to go into detail in it. It's just to give you a better understanding of what multi-criteria analysis is in order to make you understand how we've been collaborating with the various stakeholders in, in this analysis. So if you look in the very top line on your right hand, you will see the four land use options that I described before, communal livestock grazing, private cattle ranches, etc. If you look at the first column on your left hand, you got the criteria of the multi-criteria analysis. Which, is, which are the criteria against which each land use option has been assessed. And these are the key ecosystem services delivered in the study area. So you look at commercial food production, wild food production, fuel construction material, etc. cetera. Uh, so now you have an idea of the different kind of criteria that we have in the analysis. And if you look in the next column of the different kind of indicators that we developed, these criteria and indicators can be developed independently by the researcher or in cooperation with the stakeholders. Um, so the MCDA, I will just refer to multi-criteria as MCDA, options are discussed as a group in a way as fair as possible to make fair decision. So well, you, can, uh, you can have a workshop consultation where you invite a wide range of stakeholders that must be as much representative as possible of the widest range of uh, society. So you have, uh, of course, decision makers, so government departments uh, from all types of sectors, agriculture, energy, tourism, etc. International organizations, civil society, 
representatives and the private sector. And this, this tool, MCDA, is a tool that can be used to facilitate interactions. So the aim is not to influence decisions of, of local stakeholders, but to facilitate their, their interactions so that they can come up with a, with a shared vision and objectives. Uh, in this case, uh, the options that I outlined in the table before of the multi-criteria analysis can be discussed in the state, in the workshop, so that the local stakeholders can identify what are the options that are most relevant, relevant to the country, what are the key ecosystem services delivered there, what, what are the key objectives of the research. And the options and, and the weighting of the criteria were identified as an outcome of group interaction. Now, what am I referring to when I talk about weighting the criteria? Uh, mainly, if you look into the different ecosystem services, uh, they, can be, they can play a different uh, importance or they can be considered must or less relevant to different people in society. Uh, so, uh, the weighting is used in order to ensure that the final outcome of the analysis reflects what is least or most important to society. So, in the workshop environment, society as a whole is represented by the range of different uh, workshop participants that have been asked to rank each of the criteria according to their, relev to their importance, according to their own perception. So, as you can imagine, there is not just one common view in society. For, for a person that is working on agriculture, cattle production might be the, the, the relevant issue. For somebody else that is working on, on, uh, on, uh, on a, from a different sector, on a different perspective, cattle production might not be the key criteria. And if you look at this table, we see that uh, commercial food production has been identified as the, as the key criteria, followed by groundwater extraction, wild food. That means that compared to look at the last um, criteria, spiritual inspiration, it means that when we compare commercial food production with spiritual inspiration, commercial food production is considered most relevant. So it will play a bigger role in, in the overall scoring of the analysis. So it's quite obvious that depending on how the stakeholders interact and on what and on their final decision on the ranking of these criteria and on the options, we will have a different outcomes of the research and different findings. So their input is somehow ensured since the very early stage of the research. Then in the research planning again, uh, it's important to 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 listen to the local perspectives. So in the identification of study sites, uh, I attached here a couple of photos. We've been exploring the area with, uh, uh, with two government representatives. The two gentlemen that you see are from the Ministry of uh, Agriculture that introduced us to the area and to the uh, local represent representatives and village committees. Uh, once we were familiar with the areas, we were able to make a selections of the farmers that we would like to talk to. So in the data collection, again, MCDA gives us the chance to use and combine a range of quantitative and qualitative methods of research. And again, I wish to stress the importance of local knowledge as a valuable source of information. The people that you see in these photos know better than anybody else how the environment is, has been changing in their area and what kind of measures would be needed in order to support their livelihoods. Uh, if you look at the photo in black and white, you see this farmer. He was so passionate in the way he was uh, uh, outlining, talking about his own farm and his cattle, and he was uh, outlining according to his view what measures should the government take to support him. So all of this data is integrated then and translated into 
uh, a coherent set of scientific data that was then put into that matrix that I showed you in the, in the beginning of the presentation. And in the final stage of research, again, disseminating the, re the results and implementing, uh, again, uh, here you see some photos from a war final policy workshop that we had, which objective was to disseminate the project findings to the policymakers that have been involved since the earlier stage of research. So you get the chance again to talk about the indicators, to talk about the findings and, and about the ways forward. And again, it's not a way to, I would say, influence their decisions because their decisions must come from them. It's a, it's a facilitation tool that allows these key stakeholders to sit around the same table and confirm themselves on, on, on the topics. And, and come out with, with new ideas and possibilities for collaborations or ways forward. And it's also a way to get the feedback uh, about the findings with the inputs from the policy audience. So it was a way for us to know if our findings were relevant and what kind of research gaps there are still in the area and what kind of future research directions should the research take. Um, so to conclude, I, I, in this presentation, I just wanted to very briefly outline how MCDA can be used to engage with stakeholders, but certainly there is not one blueprint method that, that can be used to engage with stakeholders, and the success in engaging rather than not being able to engage will depend on some key factors that here I define as secrets to success that are also uh, outlined in the, in the video from uh, Mark Reed. First of all, you have to identify the right people and organizations. So you have to make a very careful selections of, of, the, of the actors that you're uh, inviting to join your, your discussions and ensure that they are as much representative as possible of the widest range of sectors and people in society. And they must be able together to, web, to develop a, a set of shared and achievable goals. And point number two, you must be a really good facilitator and create the right atmosphere. Uh, things will not work automatically. You have to be uh, proactive, passionate, and able to engage with people, create a, an environment that is comfortable to them, speak their own language. You have to make it relevant to connect to the third point. The language you would speak with a, with a farmer is different than the language you will speak with a policymaker, obviously. You just have to be able to make a close connection. And you have to make it relevant to them in a way that you are not just distributing information or, or, or guiding them on what they have to do, but you have to negotiate with them what outputs they want to get out of their participation. So if there is commitment since the very beginning of the research until the, the finalization of the project outcomes and findings, there is a higher likelihood that that stakeholders that have been involved with will be, first of all, more interested in here listening to your findings, but also being interested in playing a proactive role in the future in order to to, to make a move forward and promoting uh, change. Um, I think it's quite uh, clear that uh, we will always be facing challenges. It is not easy. It is, there is not a straightforward way to do it, but I hope that we've been providing you with some useful insight that will make you think about uh, possible ways to structure your, uh, your, um, your research plans in the forthcoming part of the ELD MOOC. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm available to answer to your questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much for this uh, short presentation on uh, multi-criteria decision uh, analysis. Um, I think there was a question earlier. 
uh, on one of the first slides with the many numbers. You may want to mm -hmm. go back to that sure. one. There was a, there was the question. What do these numbers mean? Uh, maybe that's a yeah. good opportunity to talk about economic valuation. That topic was part of the first MOOC, but I think it's yeah. it shows very uh, it, it's a good opportunity to uh, dive a little deeper into the uh, methods that ELD mm -hmm. is all about. Sure, um, these numbers are. MCDA scores. So uh, the we they are the outcome of a combination of qualitative and quantitative assessments. Some of these criteria were assessed from a quantitative perspective in monetary terms. For example, if you look at the first one, commercial food production, we got net profit of meat production as an indicator. And this can this is an information that can be derived by financial statements that are provided uh, by the farmers, for example. But some other indicators were derived by qualitative criteria. So maybe it will just be a ranking availability of that criteria, uh, low, high, medium. Now, the question will be how do you compare all of these different uh, indicators uh, there are well i can provide more detailed explanation maybe later on there are methods to translate all of these different rankings into an homogeneous scale that goes from 0 to 100 which is the mcda score so these numbers that you see in this matrix are the, the homogeneous MCDA scores that allow us to compare all of the different uh, criteria. Uh, the scores in brackets are the weighted scores. So as I said before, uh, some criteria play a higher role than other according to the assessment and the perspective of the stakeholders as assessed in the workshop. So um, the, 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 the numbers in brackets are the, the weighted numbers that reflect the, the, the relevant importance of each criteria to society. Um, and then you got the final line at the bottom, the total, 67, 52, etc., which is the, the total score that is represented in the diagram that you see here, so the four lines. For example, if you see the, the, the taller line is uh, the one that achieved the highest MCDA score, which is communal livestock grazing. That means that it performed better rather than private game ranches that are the ones that achieved the lowest score. Then I will stop here in order to allow time maybe for some more questions because I, otherwise I can keep going forever on the explanation. Um, okay, there are two questions. Uh, one by uh, uh, one by Patrick that says. Uh, which are the risks that the facilitator may bias the independent decision making and what measures shall be taken in order to reduce them? Yeah, uh, well, whenever a facilitator is involved with, uh, with the discussion and with making decisions on criteria or indicators, there will always be a risk that he or she can influence the decisions of the group. So as I stressed in my last slide, uh, you have to be a really good facilitator in order to make the most out of this method. Uh, being a good facilitator means, first of all, having enough experience to be able to to handle a, a group of people and, and, and just facilitate their discussion without playing a dominant role. It means uh, being able to, to facilitate the interaction of some people in the group that might not be relevant or might not be playing a dominant role because they are dominated by other people in the discussion. So again, it's about being constantly aware of what is going on around and making the, 
the best possible to, in order to to let everybody uh, speak. And again, it's uh, it's about not uh, going to the room and saying, okay, these are the indicators and we believe that this one is better than the other. Do you all agree with that? Because this is a biased quest, bias question already. It is really about uh, trying to be impartial and again, we, we all have different uh, skills. A person that might be good in research might not be as good as a facilitator rather than somebody else. That's why we always work in a team. And in a team, uh, we should be able to com complement each other. Um, yes, next question. Okay, there's a question by uh, Felicia. Would it be proper to use these weightings for other case studies in Botswana? Uh, I mean, generally speaking, if there is no uh, possibility to derive that kind of data through a direct consultation with stakeholders, uh, it is a common practice to use similar data from uh, similar other parts of the country, if available in literature, in order to to shape further research. Uh, we think, for example, to the benefit transfer method. So I will say uh, these uh, these weightings certainly provides uh, a, a picture of what's the perspective of the local stakeholder in Kalahari. Of the of the different of the relevance of the different ecosystem services, so it can be used to inform uh, other research. But then, if you are planning to to start a brand new multi criteria analysis in a different region, of course, the ideal op op way to go for it would be to have a, a another stakeholder consultation. Mm -hmm. There's a question by Aquitam. Who takes the benefit of the output when relevant stakeholders contribute and how can that be negotiated? Who gets the benefit of the output? Uh, I'm not sure what what does this refer to. I mean, are we talking about, if we're talking about the benefits of uh, of these ecosystem services that are delivered to society? Um, or are we talking about how are these shared among the different uh, groups in society? Maybe if you can please clarify. Or, uh, well, in the meanwhile, while I wait for a clarification, I will say that um, the fact that a particular type of land use can provide a certain range of benefits does not necessarily imply that these benefits will be uh, shared equally in society. Uh, that is one reason why the communal livestock grazing has achieved a higher score in the analysis rather than the private ranches, because private ranches to be tend to provide uh, quite higher uh, income, uh, a higher income source to, the, for example, to the cattle producer. But these benefits remain within the, the private ranch. While in communal livestock grazing areas, if you see uh, the different colors in the bar, uh, you see that a wider range of ecosystem service benefits are provided. And, 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 and these affect a higher amount of population. So they will provide the highest impact overall when you look at the at society as a whole. I don't know at all if I answer to your question, but otherwise, please feel free to get in touch with me afterwards. Okay, there's another question by Patrick. Uh, can I use MCDA to analyze the potential for adopting an agricultural technology, technology by small scale farmers, e.g. power tools? 
Yeah, yeah. Multi-criteria analysis is really flexible and it can be used in a, in a wide range of sectors and on a wide range of topics. Uh, whenever you have uh, a different uh, range of options that you want to assess against uh, a different range of measures or or or, or values, multi-criteria analysis can be can be adapted. Mm, then, how to do it? Well, you can. Uh, if you want more information on that, I can I can provide a few links on uh, on the use of multi-criteria analysis. And we can certainly refer uh, to the link to the ELD report of the study that I just presented today. Okay. Uh, we'll be able to, uh, to take some questions by audio. So if you want to raise a question by uh, using your microphone, uh, you may raise your hand. And uh, I will open the microphone for you. If you ra want to raise your hand to indicate a question, then you see a, a hand in the upper left corner. Click on that hand and um, I'll see that you would like to speak and then I'll open the microphone for you. In the meanwhile, I can uh, answer to Irina's question, uh, maybe, which has, who is asking how long lasts the gathering first information about ecosystem services on the territory and how long lasts researching. So uh, this can be quite variable because uh, one of the key challenges was in the beginning was to get a research permit which has to be granted by the government and uh, and uh, when you put together your application for the permit you're excited and you're already planning your your uh, your field trip and then you end up waiting up to one year to get to get the permit signed and released and uh, if you're lucky it can take much less than that but I'm just saying that you have to be aware of this constraint and without a research permit you are not formally allowed to to carry out research you can still travel to the country and talk to a farmer but you can definitely not set up meetings or workshop with policymakers if you don't have that signed piece of paper. So this can, uh, this can have a huge impact on the total amount of time for research. But I will say uh, a few months just to, to, to review the literature, so that's based review and, and set up the research plan and then if several months spent in the field to collect data uh, i would say three months will be will be a good amount of time it can take much less or much longer depends on the level of commitment and financial resources available and then you have to consider that you need quite a few months then to to collect to review the data and analyze the data and 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 publish the data so draft the documents and have a final workshop so I will say in between seven months and and one year but it can be really variable okay um, I have a question um, at what point um, does um, this um, kind of um, information uh, get conveyed? Are you invited by the decision makers to present that information or uh, do you come and, and uh, share the information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, again, I guess it's quite variable because there is not one way to 
to keep engaged with the stakeholders afterwards. So it really much depends on on, uh, on the kind of of link that you have with them. Uh, in our case, we we have uh, organized and planned the policy workshop, and we've been very proactive in uh, getting in touch with all of the relevant mm-hmm. stakeholders and ensuring that they will be able to attend the workshop. Uh, so, again, it is not just a one-way uh, communication, us getting our research findings and getting our publications published uh, and that just distributing, um, you know, copy of our publications or maybe of uh, policy briefs. Uh, because uh, a document can get to the inbox of somebody. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to either read it or even if he or she reads it, going to communicate with other people. So it is really about getting them on board and communicating the results but getting a feedback from them. So it's a two-way interaction. Mm-hmm. There's a question, uh, as an expert, is it all right to use compromise as a decision when you find that farmers' highest priority is not key solution in addressing a problem? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, a key point of doing, of using waiting here in the analysis is again to, to, try to reflect uh, at the best possible way the, the overall priorities in society. But society is, uh, I mean, uh, is perspectives can be quite variable. So what is important for me as a farmer might not be important for another person from a different uh, perspective. So... Of course, all priorities must be taken into consideration and can certainly be discussed when we, when you discuss about the different trade-offs among different, the use of different technologies of land use options or management strategies. Uh, if, uh, if something is just relevant for a few farmers and not for the broader range of people in society, it does not mean that it does not deserve to be mentioned. It can still be discussed. But then, again, it will still, the, the key goal is to come out with shared goals and objectives mm-hmm. that are more or less agreed by, by everyone, even if it will not, never be possible to get a situation where everyone will agree on one uh, concept. Okay. There's a question from Alice. Uh, how do you deal with uncertainty in your case studies? Uncertainty in the in the type of data sources and the quality of data, or uncertainty in the way that when I'm driving my four by four wheel drive on sand, I don't know if I'm gonna get stuck or not. <laughs> Because there is a lot of uncertainty also in uh, in uh, carrying out the field work. Uh, in the outputs, um, okay, uh, these links may be more to the more advanced economic uh, assessment that we carry out as part of the ELD initiative. And the, what I presented here is a combination of quantitative and qualitative criteria. But we've been evolving on on uh, on this analysis for a more quantitative perspective. We run stochastic simulations through Monte Carlo analysis, um, where we we came out with economic estimates, monetary estimates for each single uh, criteria of this MCDA analysis. And in these estimates, we, we work on, uh, on a range of values where we have confidence intervals. I don't know if you're, um, if maybe not all of you are familiar with this terminology, but basically we, we set an, we set an interval or, or a range of values in which uh, the, the real value might be found. So we recognize the fact that the, that specific number is not just the, 
the exact number, but there might be some uncertainty about it. And the uncertainty can be higher or, or smaller depending on how big the, the interval is. Okay. Um, I think before we come to the webcam part of our live event, uh, we'd have time to take one more question. Otherwise, I would switch on to the, I would switch on the webcams. But there's another question. Could, Nicola, could you name some methods in order to analyze and value the local knowledge and also how to analyze variables such as created demand than actual rather than actual needs? Yeah. Uh, again, I can refer you to a very useful um, a very useful diagram that outlines all of the methods that can be used, either demand or non-demand based methods. Um, this is uh, something that is also outlined in the in the ELD uh, practitioner guides and in the material that was available in the MOOC from last year. There, uh, different types of methods can be used depending on data availability. Uh, sometimes um, just monetary, monetary uh, information is available, so we can use market prices and all of that kind of uh, measures. Uh, sometimes we can use uh, replacement costs or, or uh, contingent valuation where you set up different options and then which are just scenarios that, that are not necessarily real but uh, give us the chance to to discuss about the different options, and then the respondents will will just uh, provide their inputs based on the option available, and this will give you like an indication of the uh, of the uh, value of uh, of a certain variable or ecosystem service. Um, there are there is a wide range of these methods. Again, I can provide uh, I can provide uh, a diagram for that, where you will find uh, all of the relevant information, and it's in the LD uh, literature available online. Okay, I guess that's it for this afternoon. Thank you, Nicola Favetto from Unu Inve. Thank you for this presentation. If you have questions, put them in the forum and um, Nicola may respond to those. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we come to the uh, fun part. I'm gonna, I gonna activate all the webcams. So if you have a webcam for those of you who joined, you may switch on your webcam now. I see many of you do have a webcam. Click on that little red camera sign next to your name. There's Ali, there's Miguel, Miguel Kudrat. So click on that little webcam icon next to your name. There's hello. Felicia, hello. And you'll be seen here. So, good to see you. Who else have we got? The Felicia, Ephraim, good to see you again. The other attendees are shy. Yeah, hello. So here's a time to switch on your webcam. So this afternoon session featured Nicola Favretto. Next session will be a very long one. It will be a two-hour session. Hi. Hello, Anna. Next week we'll have a presentation by Stacy Noel, who did uh, the presentation in week one as well. 
by Thomas Falk and Ann Jübner. And then we'll have the second presentation by Bob Costanza and Ida Kubischewski, who are based in Australia. So this will be a truly global experience or almost or at least as global as this one. So good to see you. And I see many new participants have joined this MOOC. I just checked the survey that many of you did and um, almost 75% of the MOOCs participants this year or filled in the survey are new and didn't join the first MOOC. So this is uh, very good that we are getting all kinds of new experience in the MOOC and are able to expand the community. So, okay, I would uh, then close this session. Nicola, thank you very much. Thank you all for your attention and for your interesting questions and okay. interested questions. <laughs>